And so today I'm going to introduce the work of Carol Backey, who is an Adelaide ac academic who's written quite uh, extensively in the field of policy analysis. So I'm going to try to use her material as a way of beginning a discussion with you about curriculum as policy. I'm going to move then to look at the material that we've, we've given some voice to and then look at critiquing that material through the lenses of critical race analysis. And in doing that, I want to sort of see how we can discover if there is such a thing as whether or not there's hidden discourses of racism embedded within the national curriculum. I then want to move into the third area, which is to give some sense of what that looks like in terms of student learning. And lastly, I want to actually sort of provide some opportunities for a way forward. I don't want to leave us in a space of thinking that it's all doom and gloom. It seems to us, I guess for those even who've worked in curriculum, the curriculum in itself would appear to be a fairly standard educational tool. That is, what's the content, how do we scope and sequence it across time, and what is it we expect students to be able to achieve at certain periods of time. Backey's view, of course, is that we need to look behind that and actually sort of look at more closely the problems that have been represented within the process of policy development. So question two reflects on the underlying premises in the representation of a problem. In question three, she asked us to consider the contingent practices and processes with which this understanding of the problem has actually emerged. So what is the background that has actually brought this forward? And I've listed these basically as reconciliation, contested narratives, and socio-political legitimacy. And there are three issues which are embedded, either directly, as is in the first, and I think you can see many examples of reconciliation, which has been clearly evident right through the curriculum. That which has been problematised, which I believe is the third one, which is what is the socio-political legitimacy of Aboriginal people in this country? And the second, which goes to the heart of the content in the history curriculum, which is how is contested narratives of Australian nation making actually discussed? I would argue that collectively these demonstrate curriculum parallels which are parallel the broader political discourse which is occurring in this nation. That is that the, uh, the place of Aboriginal people has been largely pushed towards acceptance of reconciliation. And I, I, I guess, as has been asked many times by Aboriginal people, who is reconciling with whom? And what has been reconciled to? I then turned that around and said, well, if you're an Aboriginal student, or if you're a student wanting to understand it from the Aboriginal perspective, what would that look like? And again, aggregating that content from kindergarten to year 10. What we end up is with looking at the conflict again was inevitable. It was short in duration and occurred only at a local level. Certainly there was no sense of a plan to wipe out, to move Aboriginal people on and to take their land. The conflict was basically primarily over issues of exclusive access to land. Note that the words exclusive access to land. It was about private ownership versus Aboriginal connectedness to country. The conflict was localised and small scale and not long in duration. That often conflict occurred through cultural unintelligibility. That is, that there was no way for them to communicate and therefore that lack of communication was the root cause of much of the conflict. That massacres were the consequence of individual and small groups of lawless activity on the frontier, both from the Aboriginal people and by those who were on the frontier moving into Aboriginal land and that massacres were unfortunate, but something had happened long ago. Out of this narrative, of course, there is nothing to tell us about the colonial management of Aboriginal people, of missions or reservations, farm labourers and the impact of socio-cultural life or of community agency. These things I think I've tried to capture around the notion of denial, the rejection and existence of what actually happened the decontextualisation of content, so we lose any sense of the locality of what occurred. We also have the, the language of omission, 
the racial dimension of social interactions being ignored. Those also, of course, it legitimates and privileges our European presence and the consequence of, of European views and their histories and knowledge over Aboriginal people. And it constructs a version of Aboriginal legal and moral legitimacy and sovereignty from a white perspective. So then I think we come towards the end of where I wanted to take this discussion, going back to the question of how Australian is the Australian curriculum. By posing these questions, instead of the questions which the, and, and the problems that have been written into the curriculum, rather that maybe we should be starting from trying to set the big question and work backwards into the curriculum. That is, do we want students to be able to talk about the nature of Aboriginal disadvantage? Do we want students to be able to talk about the real experiences of Aboriginal people living in the local community and how these match with the cited as, or what has been cited as representative of the Aboriginal experience? What happens in your community and was it represented more broadly? Can we talk about the structures that inhibit Aboriginal people to overcome the disadvantage within the current socio-political structures of Australia? Now these questions are questions that we would want students as they start to move towards adulthood to be able to answer. And I guess what I'm posing is that without setting those questions and working back into the curriculum, we're never going to be able to get students to be able to engage in these answers.